Well, it's a beautiful day God has created for us. Um, the title of this message is, Do Not Put New Wine in Old Bottles. Mark is a book that puts a robust view of pure religion and the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's fast-paced, moving, and I changed my mind. I think I'd like to go through Mark for our next um, scripture and Bible study. Um, and the true essence of religion is who do you worship and how do you worship them, if you think about it. Because religion is about the God and how you worship that God. Let's go to Mark 2, 18 and 19. There's some very interesting things there that uh, I think will help clarify things for all of us. Mark 2, 18 and 19. Most of what we're going to talk about will be in the first, second, and third chapters of Mark. Um, 2, 18 and 19. And the disciples of John and the Pharisees used to fast, and they'd come and say unto him, Why do your disciples, um, <clears throat> why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Um, he says, The day will come when they will fast. Well, you remember the Pharisees fasted in public to prove their piety. Um, and Christ later said, you, you should fast in such a way. People don't know you're fasting. You know, wash up and shave and the whole thing. Um, Verse 21 and 22, no man also, but it leads into this discussion that I really want to emphasize. It leads into this. Uh, after saying that about fasting, he says, no man also sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece shall, that filled it takes away from the old, and the rent is made worse. No man puts new wine into old bottles, um, <clears throat> else the new wine doth Burst the bottles, and the wine spills, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put in new bottles. In those days, the bottles were wine skins, and they were sewed together, probably two or three pieces, a big sack with a spout on it. And when you put wine in, having made wine for years, it's going to ferment some more and create more gas and bubble. Well, if if it's a new bottle, new wine, they'll kind of ill the bottle will stretch and the wine and it will stretch together. But if you, if you put new wine in old bottles, the bottle is already stretched as far as it can stretch, I mean the skins. And when that wine ferments, it's going to burst it. Now Christ is using this as an, uh, an analogy to make a point that we want to emphasize here for a minute. What Christ is saying is that the religious methods and attitudes and understanding of that day, around 30 A.D., were wrong, and he was bringing something new to them, a deeper understanding of the gospel and worship of the true God. Now, th this is not, if you take this verse to mean that everything God had already written was wrong, that doesn't make any sense. Christ was a God of the Old Testament, as mentioned in Mark and other books as well. He's one that, that ate with Abraham and talked to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments and other laws and regulations. So God is not contradicting himself. What he is saying is the Judaism of the day, that had been roughly 30 AD, that had developed since the post-captivity era was way off course. And Christ was bringing them something new to them. Uh, and just as a side, the Israelites even in the days of Moses and all the other great prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah, they never really understood God. Only a few of the prophets were even listened to. There are a few good kings of Judah that listened to the prophets, but, well, for the northern ten tribes, they got worse, 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 and even horrible worse. Uh, Judah was up and down, but almost all the prophets were persecuted. And some of the prophets were even sons of priests, their priestly friends turned on them when they told them the truth. We need to repent. And people don't like to be told they're wrong. Uh, so um, even the true religion, when it was presented by Moses and the prophets, the people, for the most part, didn't get it 
and resisted. They practically drove Moses crazy. I really think, this is an opinion, one reason that God took Moses' life at 120, he probably said to himself, Moses, 40 years of leading these Israelites is enough aggravation for you. You need to rest and I'll take care of you in the world tomorrow. Let somebody younger have the, the misery of dealing with the Israelites for the next 40 years. And that was Elijah. I mean, uh, Joshua. But the point I'm making is even in the Old Testament, the Israelites, with a few exceptions, O oh, kings here and there, did not really understand the religion of the true God. So there's, there's God's true religion and there's Judaism. I'm making a difference here between the two because it, it's important that we understand it. Mark 2, going back a little bit, backwards, 2, 5, and 7. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, uh, the man that was sick of the palsy, you know, like cerebral palsy, he was paralyzed. Uh, Son, thy sins be forgiven you. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. They're right there in the room with him. Why does this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? Christ doesn't contradict this, he says. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why reason you these things in your heart? Verse 9. Is it easier to say to the sick of palsy, man, it's probably totally paralyzed, your sins be forgiven you, and say, rise and take up thy bed and walk, um, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That's another way of saying he was God, because only God can forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, rise, take up your bed, and go your way into their house. And of course, it immediately he rose. So Christ was at no point denied his uh, deity. He actually emphasized it to the frustration and anger of the scribes and Pharisees. But the true worship of the true God, I really believe they, the scribes and Pharisees could have done better. When we look at Mark and many other scriptures, Matthew 5 or Christ it showed the true spiritual meaning of his law. And it's, and it's not easy to understand it completely, uh, being carnal like we are, but they could have done better, but they didn't. Um, but the religion given by Moses had been taken off course by the scribes and the Pharisees. The rabbinical Judaism is not pure religion. What they had done is, at some point when they came back from captivity, they said, we realize that all this idolatry and other things we're doing is causing us to go astray. And it was a theocracy under the Roman Empire, but they were in charge. The Romans, as long as you paid their taxes and let them garrison troops and obeyed certain laws, they didn't really care. You could do your own religion. They had a bunch of religions in the Roman Empire. So there was a theocracy under the Roman Empire so they built laws and rules and like layer upon layer. It's like the Supreme Court. You know, most judges come from very liberal law schools. Heard a thing about that today. And they don't even let any law applicants in. This one man from a major law school said, University of Chicago Law School, if they sense any conservative trends. I mean, literally, that's what he said, any. And they rarely go back to the Constitution. They go back to what other lawyers and judges talked about other lawyers and judges who talked about other lawyers and judges who ruled on the Constitution. It's like a, a spider web of layer after layer after layer. And that's how you get some of these decisions that you read the Constitution, you say, wait a minute, how did they get that out of the Constitution? Well, that's the way. Well, the Pharisees and scribes were the same way. They made all kinds of laws locking the people in, but what they did was they moved them away from the pure worship of the true God, and that's what Christ was bringing. Um, Mark 2.23 is one really good example. Mark 2.23, it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. It probably was some other grain, I'm told, but it doesn't really matter for the point we're making. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do you on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Now, you'll go through the Old Testament. You won't see anywhere where it defines how much grain you're able to take or ears of corn 
and they would just rub them and blow the husk off so they could eat them. There were no fast food restaurants in those days, and they were traveling. By the way, in the law, they had to leave the corners of their field. They didn't harvest them, and whatever was just got missed, so that people who needed food could just walk through the fields and harvest them. So it was kind of like food for the poor and needy. So it wasn't anything illegal of them taking the food. It was the, the Pharisees said, yeah, but you had to rub the husk off and blow on it before you ate it. And by their rules, they had over 613 Sabbath rules, that's harvesting. I know that's legalistic kind of thinking, um, but that's how they reason. Um, now let's look at what Christ said. Verse 25, and he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he had need and was hungry, he and they that were with him? David was fleeing from Saul who had tried to kill him and had the army out looking for him. Saul just went bonkers with his jealousy of David, as you probably know the story. David was fleeing with just a few men, and uh, he needed a weapon, he needed some food. So he went to the high priest, and they gave him food that only the priest was supposed to eat and, and one of the Goliath's sword. How he went to the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them that were with him. Now, the context of that, Christ is saying, that's okay. David was not condemned for that. What does that tell you about God? Uh, let me read the next verse, and I'll explain it to you a little more. Um, and he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The way the Pharisees had the rules set up, the people were locked in, locked down. I believe the Sabbath was very miserable for most of them because of all the rules that, that the Pharisees made. And Christ said, You don't really understand why it's there. But getting back to David, can you see that um, Christ was saying human needs can sometimes override a very technical, legalistic, picky application of the law? Because nowhere were the law about food you know, that comes off of the, uh, the sacred altar, the only the priest was supposed to eat. Nowhere is that law said to be wrong. He was just saying when there are emergency situations, if you understand the meaning of the Sabbath, you'll do the appropriate thing. But the Pharisees seem to have had no spiritual understanding. No spiritual understanding because they kept making restrictive laws and they couldn't see beyond that. It's better to teach the true meaning of God's law, if it's the Sabbath or anything else, and let people make their own decisions about how much they'll do, won't do, and let them be responsible. If someone, because one minister was asked this question many years ago, but he, he mentioned this in class. If someone says, well, how many dishes can I wash on the Sabbath? They wanted him to give them a number so they could, you know, that's the kind of thing the Pharisees would say. Well, we said, we're not going to get into that kind of thing. It's between you and God. You do what you think is right and, and what makes you enjoy the Sabbath and don't worry about it. Um, you see the difference between that approach and a legalistic approach. Two, two cups and no saucers. That's probably, what the, that's probably what the scribes and Pharisees would say. If you do three cups, oh, you're in big trouble. Well, you can see how petty that is. Um, now, some people think because we keep the holy days and we believe all the Bible was inspired when properly understood, that, we have a, that we're kind of Jewish. And some of the splinter groups that are splintered off of us have gotten real Jewish, um, and some even call their leaders rabbis, even though Christ said not to do that. Let me just go to Matthew 23, because I want to prove that point, that Christ said not to do it, and they still do it anyway, because they get, well, people get caught up in little picky things, and they try to get too Jewish. Matthew 23, verse 6. We'll read 6 through 10, Matthew 23. Now, he's criticizing openly in front of the people, the Pharisees. Um, here's what Christ says, he, and the scribes. He admitted that they have power. They sit in Moses' seat. But he said this, They love the uppermost rooms of the feast and chief seats in the synagogue. 
up front, I guess they had little balcony seats in the whatever they had up front where everybody could see them. Oh, there's Pharisee Joe in the top seat up there, showing how important he is. And greetings in the marketplace to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. Be you not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. There are actually two different words for Rabbi, but the one that Christ is referring to and the one that apparently the Pharisees used, it means exalted teacher, master. And we only have one exalted teacher, master, and that's Jesus Christ. But let me finish reading what he said here. Um, Be you not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and you're all brethren, and call no man father. He means in the spiritual sense. And we all know that churches don't read that sort of thing, um, which is in heaven. Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And I want to emphasize this next verse, verse 11. But he that's greatest among you shall be your servant. And that is the opposite of what the Pharisees set up. As leaders, the people serve them. They even exempted themselves from some of their own rules. Like, you know, some of our government officials have put taxes and rules on us, like Social Security, the new health care law, that they are exempted from. I just thought you might... They, it's an interesting comparison. And I think some of the government bureaucrats, as one lady said as she testified before Congress, instead of them serving the public, being our servants, they see us as their servant. And that's how most governments work, by the way. But that's really not the Christian way. In other words, if you're going to be a leader in this church, God says you should serve, serve, serve. Leadership is not about your big ego. It's about serving the people, and you're going to work harder than anybody else, or at least you should. Um, so we're going to go back to Mark, but first I want to tell this story. It's called You're Late. Okay, the general went out uh, <clears throat> to find that none of his GIs were there for this special meeting he had, and then a man comes up, sorry, sir, I can explain. You see, I had a date in town and I it ran a little late. I ran to the bus. I missed it. I held a cab. The cab broke down. I found a farmer, bought a horse from him, and the horse dropped dead miles before the camp gate. And I had to run the rest of the way. Ha, ha, ha. The general was very skeptical about the explanation, but at least he was there and wasn't too late, so he forgot it. Eight more GIs came in panting. Ha, ha. They were late. We all had the same story. Sorry, sir. I had a date. It ran a little late. I ran to the bus, missed it. I hailed a cab. It broke down. I found a farmhouse, bought a horse, and I rode him too hard, and he died miles before I got to the gate and I had to run this way. <sighs> the general eyed them, feeling very skeptical. They all have the same excuse, but since he let the first guy go, I guess I'd let the other go. And the last guy jogged up to the general, panting. Huh, huh, huh. <sighs> let me guess the general interrupted. Um, you had a date in town, right? Yes. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and then you hailed a cab. The guy was about to talk. He says, no, no, uh, it, the, the, the cab broke down, right? The man said, no, sir, said the GI. There were so many dead horses in the road, it took forever to get around them. <laughs> the last guy was smart enough to... <laughs> Adjusted too many dead horses in the road. <laughs> um, so I use that joke to make the example. This guy added something different to, I guess, their written excuse. He was so clever. But that's what got the Pharisees off track. They kept adding to God's law and making it, I guess they call it more legalistic, more comprehensive, more detailed. I guess I understand their thinking. We're not giving people any excuse for anything. We're going to lock them down tight. And I believe Satan has deceived the whole world. If you go to Revelation 12, 9, it actually says Satan has deceived the whole world. And, of course, that includes the Jewish nation. So I'm not saying I'm surprised that this is true. And only a scattered few, both Jews and Gentiles, see the full truth, and, or at least a great deal of the full truth, and know certain deeper understandings. Well, what's one of Satan's methods of throwing people off? Getting you to add something on to the law. Like a couple of ministers, this is way, way back when I first came to the church, they said, 
Fasting 24 hours on atonement's not hard enough. You're not suffering enough. You gotta start eight hours early. Natalie will tell you a story about it. Well, they're adding on. Now, if you wanna do that on your own because you think you wanna, you know, although I'd be cautious about fasting too many hours, but it depends on how healthy you are, but if you wanna do that on your own, but you can't make that a policy that everybody in the church has to do. That's what they were trying to do. And it got straightened out um, fairly quickly, but, but you don't want to start adding on to God's law um, because the, you know, no, remember, true religion is worshiping the right God the right way. It's who God is and how do you worship him. So they polluted the how to worship God. Um, and from their point of view, they were fighting pagan influences and, but you can go to two extremes. You can get self-righteous as they did and lock everybody down with all kinds of rules. Or you can go the other extreme and start taking away from the law and saying, well, we want to fit in with the pagan world around us, and so we'll make concessions and kind of do what they want, and maybe we'll relabel it. Both of those are wrong. But we're talking about the Jews right now, so let's go back to Mark. Go to Mark 7. I think that's what I want to emphasize in this message a bit today. In Mark 7, verse 6 through 9, Mark 7, verse 6, uh, he answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written. Now here's what the prophet Isaiah said about the people of Israel, and it's years, centuries earlier, but it still applies, Christ said. This people honor me with their lips but their heart is far from me. They do profess to worship God, but howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now he's referring to all the writings the Jews have. They've got books, and you could get into it if you want to get into all that sort of thing, about the law and about God and, and their own traditions. Laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things. They had all kind of ritual washings where you had to do a whole bunch of things and, and let the water, ritual things. The Jews have tons of rituals. Now every tradition and ritual is not bad, but Christ is referring to many of their traditions actually undermined the principle of the law, actually turned it on its head. Um, we'll just look for a few minutes at just one. And he said to them, full well you reject the commandments of God that you may keep your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. By the way, in those days before Social Security, honoring your elderly parents meant you took care of them. When they were too old to work in the farm, uh, the younger generation took care of them. Um, and whoso curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man shall come to his father and mother and say, it is Corban, that is, Say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, you shall be free. In other words, what the Pharisees said, look, if you give a certain amount of money to the temple treasury, which they control, isn't that convenient? Which they control. You give a certain amount of money, we'll, we'll give you a certificate, call it Corban. Then you can tell your parents, uh, well, mom and dad, I know you're in bad shape, you need somebody to take care of you, but hey, I got this right off from the Pharisees, Corban. Maybe my younger brother can take care of you but I can't because the money I would have used, I'm giving to the temple and to God's. And, and you know, it, it probably sounds religious. I'm doing it for God. I'm sacrificing my help on you for God. But they really were violating the fourth commandment. And there are others. This is just one that's mentioned. They get around the law and it's, they do it. Let's go to Mark 3. This is one that is really startling when you look at it in Mark 3. And, and I want to, before we start, I want you to think about how hard-hearted the religious leaders had become because obviously they were jealous of their leadership and they were frightened to death of Christ's popularity. Um, now they're in, a, they're, they're in a synagogue, fairly closed in space. Probably the synagogue might have been the size of this room, maybe a little bigger, but couldn't have been that much bigger probably. So they could see everything very clearly. I want to mention that. When, you know, so they have no doubts as to Christ's power. Uh, Mark 3, verse 1 and 2. 
And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. Now remember, in those days, there was no um, all the government programs and food stamps. If you had a withered hand, you know, a withered arm, you've probably seen people like, uh, you could probably do very little work. Your life was probably near starvation and or you had to take charity or sit in the street and beg. I mean, it was a real tragedy, much more than it would be today. Although it's a tragedy today, too, of course. So think about the poor man. Verse 2, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Now think about it. They're sitting there. We know Christ has the power to heal because we've heard about or seen some of the other miracles. So they knew he had the power to heal. That should have gotten them thinking about it a little bit. And all they wanted was an opportunity to accuse him. They had their own rules that you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. That was doing doctor's work. Now, let's, <clears throat> you get some idea of the evil attitude. Verse 3 and 4. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. So he told him to stand up. Everybody could see it. And he said unto him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life? Or kill. And he looked around at all those religious leaders that were staring at him, but they held their peace. In other words, they couldn't openly say, Well, Christ, if you heal this guy here on the Sabbath, you've broken our law, you've done evil. Because they couldn't argue with his logic. Is it wrong to help somebody on the Sabbath? You know, they couldn't. So they, they wouldn't say anything logic wise because they couldn't. You know, his logic was too good. By the way, bear in mind that in their rules, if one of your farm animals needed help on the Sabbath, it was okay, because that's money. You could, it, well, that's just the way it was. Notice verse 5. And when they looked around, when he, I mean Christ, looked around about on them with anger, because Christ was mad at their cold hardness for this poor man, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, stretch forth your hand. He stretched forth his hand, and is restored whole, just like it should be, just like that. Now, the Pharisees, of course, use that as an excuse to plot killing him. I want to make a point that Christ didn't actually do any work. All he said was, stretch forth your hand. He was healed. He didn't massage him for hours. He didn't you know, put him in a cast and you know, put medicine on it or stretch it. Or, he didn't do any medical work. He really couldn't call it. All he did was say, stretch a hand. It was all stretch forth your hand, and boom, there it was, normal. So to accuse him of breaking the, uh, the Sabbath by working, you see how, what a stretch that was. But that was one of the opportunities looking for. And remember, they're in close. Everybody can see the miracle. There's no doubt about was it trickery or anything. He's helping a man have a livelihood life instead of a, probably a life of, as a beggar. Um, notice verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians, another group, against him that they might destroy him. Notice, we're getting all our allies. We want to get this guy. It's just kind of amazing. This was, now you're going to ask, well, how did they get so screwed up? Let me give you an, an opinion on it. When people take a position and they're arguing back and forth over it, sometimes the, the position they take so consumes them that they lose all heart, they lose all logic. I'm giving you my opinion, but you can give me yours later. I've seen people debate on Fox. They have, you know, liberal conservative debate, debate. And often the conservative will bring up a really good point about this is really hurting jobs. And liberals will defend things that are undefensible, my opinion, because they're so caught up in winning that they're not even thinking. And it's scary. I said, the guy will now promote that weird idea? It'd be different if he said, well, you've got a good point there. However, I like this or that. No, he supports things that are weird, that are clearly bad, negative. And you wonder, all for the sake of winning. And I, and, and I see how people can get that way. That's what happened to the Pharisees. They were supporting things that are just stupid. Um, verse 8. This, um, and from Jerusalem and from Idumea, these are parts of Judea countryside, and from Jordan 
I mean, from beyond Jordan, you know, the east side of the Jordan River. Um, and Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he done, had came to see Christ. Actually, when you read the rest of it, the mobs that wanted to see Christ were so suppressing, Christ had to run off in a boat and try to get away from them. I've heard of celebrities who got so popular, if they went to the mall, it would soon cause so many people coming in, they had to close the mall down, you know, just crushing. Well, you think about how much jealousy that created among the Pharisees. The people are coming out of the woodwork to hear this guy and to see him. And their jealousy just drove them to weird extremes. The point I want to make is Christ and the Apostle Paul clearly condemned the religion of the scribes and Pharisees, which I guess you'd call it Judaism of its day. Judaism of its day missed the mark. Now, let's give the Jews credit. They did a wonderful job of preserving the Bible. Uh, all the books are written up to that point and translating it and, and honoring it. And I want to be careful that I'm not putting them down. But they were legalistic, self-righteous approach got them off track. And the point I want to make is don't, don't equate the pure religion of God with Judaism. They're two different things. Granted, the, the Jewish people did have the Bible, so they have truth. But having truth doesn't mean you don't get it mixed up. And that's true of, what can I say? The devil is clever. You might have truth, but he can get you off track. And, and too many years of getting off track, it's like shooting a rifle. You know, if you're off a little bit, by the time that bullet gets 100 yards, it's much further off. 200 yards is even further off. As the years went on and they piled more traditions up, they got further and further off the mark. Mark 3.22. Uh, <clears throat> the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, cast out the devils. And he called them unto him and said to them a parable. How can Satan cast out Satan? The reason they were saying that was he had done so many spectacular miracles, including casting out demons in a way that nobody could deny it. They couldn't gainsay his argument. Just like the people I said on Fox when a good point is brought up that they don't want to accept. They went to such extremes to fight Christ, they started calling some of his miracles the work of the devil. And he goes on to explain to them that that's the the unpardonable sin. And let me give you my explanation of what he meant by that. They were allowed to not accept Jesus Christ because Christ came to die. So the leaders, God allowed the leaders to not believe in him because he was going to die on the Passover day. And that was his first calling. But when they do things like this, call the work of the Holy Spirit, clearly healing somebody, getting them away from demons, when they call that the work of the devil, they're openly resisting God and that's bad for their character because they'll get a chance in the next resurrection and there are a number of places in the Bible we won't go through them all now where Christ warns them about blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit because it's blaspheming God and that directly affects their character and it's bad for them to do that and he's warning them about that but as I said you see people on TV support stupid untenable arguments just to win but that's how the people were in those days um, and Judaism got pushed further and further off the path. God allowed their deception, as I said, because Christ was supposed to die in the Passover. But not accepting Christ is one thing, but fighting against God's work is another thing. Um, it poisoned their character. Uh, one final verse I want to go through. This is Mark 4. Um, Mark 4, verse 10 and 11. Mark 4, 10, 11. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him about the parable. He said to them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. You know, that we're going to be in God's family, baby gods, and, and God's kingdom is going to do great things in the future. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive. They saw it, but they didn't get it. And understanding, lest at any time they should be converted 
hear and their sin should be given to them. And this, he's also quoting an Old Testament scripture that said that they see but they don't really get it. And here's what I point I want to make is um, God has only called the scattered few at the moment to know the truth. And so Judaism is deceived also, even though they may have a lot of the Bible and they honor it and that's wonderful, but they're deceived too. And I would caution people getting involved in some Jewish organization of, let's say, regular non-Jews who, who because of things that our church has taught, they want to get into Judaism, and, and maybe their leaders want to be called rabbi, and, and that's happening. I just be cautious of that sort of thing. And I don't know all the groups that are out there, and I guess you can't put all the groups under one blanket, but I just have a bad feeling it's not a good thing to get into Judaism. Maybe read one more scripture to make the point. Uh, let's go to Titus 1.14. Um, and this is not meant to put down any particular group because the whole world has got problems and what can you say? That's just the way things are. But in Titus 1.14, Paul, of course, who had to battle the um, circumcision party and all kinds of uh, clever backstabbers, he makes this statement in Titus 1.14. Um, I'll pick it up in 13, Titus 1.13. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply. He means people, he's telling Titus, rebuke sharply those people in the church that are getting into this sort of thing, that they may be sound in their faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. Judaism has its fables too, and its traditions and its things that are pulling people away from the pure religion. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, because they, they wrote all kinds of laws regarding religion, that turn from the truth. And then he goes on to say, all things that are pure are pure. So the Jews did know the true God. I mean, uh, when they came out of captivity, they stopped worshiping all the false gods like Baal and Moloch and, and all the things that you read about in the Old Testament. Um, they knew the true God. They didn't worship the fertility goddess Astarte and mess with her little eggs and stuff. Or the various sun gods like Ra and there are a bunch of other names of the sun god like sunrise services, worshiping the sun. They got away from all that, but they missed the how. And so be cautious of dealing with fringe groups that want to out-righteous the Jews and be more Jewish than they need to be. I just think it's a dangerous thing that we need to be cautious of. Because remember, both Christ and Paul criticized the Judaism of their day.